Hi, everyone. I'm Bill Squadron, President of Our Energy Policy, and welcome to our webinar today on the forecast for solar. We have a phenomenal panel that's waiting to discuss all the major issues um, in the solar sector. Um, and before we do that, uh, in addition to welcoming all of you for joining us today, I want to remind you that we have an opportunity to ask questions, which we'll do in the second part of the hour. There's a questions tab in the um, right side dashboard and just type your questions in. We'll get to as many of them as we possibly can. I also, of course, want to thank all of our partners and supporters who have been so um, so generous in their support that have allowed us to present this series and our other events at our energy policy. And I'd like to encourage everyone to go to our website, uh, take advantage of our resource library. Um, and uh, I'd also like to welcome two new partners uh, to our group, Brookhaven National Labs and Hydro Quebec. Um, but welcome to all, but thank all of our partners for their support, supporting our efforts to bring together diverse perspectives in a civil and substantive conversation to help move effective energy policy for our country in the right direction. So thanks to all of you. Um, and I'd like particularly to thank um, Schiff Harden, uh, our co-host today, and Sarah Fitz representing Schiff Harden. I'm going to turn it over to Sarah in a second. She is uh, a partner, one of the um, legal experts in the energy field, represents and advises clients on financings, joint ventures, mergers and acquisitions, development projects. She, in addition to that, is involved in numerous things on the board of the Regional Planning Association in the New York area, the co-chair of the Power Law Committee of the ABA. So uh, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, and she's going to get things going. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, Schiff Harden is really pleased to support our Energy Policy Foundation and the OEP Energy Leaders uh, Series. Schiff Harden is a national law firm uh, with proven track record of supporting our clients' success in energy and infrastructure projects. Uh, I'm also pleased to announce that as of March 1, we will be merging with Aaron Fox and will be known as Aaron Fox Schiff and we look forward to continuing to support our clients from the combined platform. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce my friend, Dr. Michael Dorsey, who will be uh, leading the Q&A on this program. Dr. Dorsey is a co-founding partner of Ibersun Solar, a Spanish utility developer. He is globally recognized expert on energy and environmental matters in the for-profit, non-profit, academic and government realms. Thank you, Dr. Dorsey. Sarah, thank you so much. It's really, truly a pleasure to be here with everybody uh, this afternoon, this morning, depending on your time zone. Uh, I'm looking forward to a really wonderful conversation with three uh, really distinguished uh, and, and amazing panelists. Uh, and I'll just go in, in the order uh, that we'll probably open up the questions and answer. We're, we're delighted and, and amazed to have uh, Marilyn Brown. Uh, Marilyn uh, is Regents Professor in Public Policy at Georgia Tech. Uh, at Tech, she directs the Climate uh, and Energy Policy Lab uh, and comes from a, a space in, in the utility regulatory space, but she's also, as a result of her uh, distinguished career, a co-recipient of the 2007 Nobel Prize. Many of you all know that was the prize awarded to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, we're also joined uh, by Garrett uh, Nielsen. Uh, Garrett is the acting director of the DOE's uh, uh, Solar and Energy Technologies Office um, in the Department of Energy. Uh, and he's really uh, cutting the path forward on the regulatory side, and, and we're looking forward to, to his uh, back and forth today. And last but certainly not least, we, we're joined by Jeff Wise. Uh, Jeff is the co founder and executive director of Distributed Sun, a uh, leading U.S. Uh, solar developer and operator. Uh, with utility scale projects in 15 states and counting. Uh, and at Distributed Sun, Jeff leads the uh, capital formation and business and development efforts. So it's truly, truly a pleasure to have you all here to you know, push this conversation around the future and the forecast of solar. Uh, so let's uh, get right into it. Um, makes sense to think of sort of the top level issues. Um, starting, let's start with Marilyn. How would you describe the, the current state of the solar industry from your vantage? Uh, what are the challenges that you see? Um, and what are the things, particularly 
that have slowed some solar development down in, in recent years. Can you talk about those issues? I can, but I'd first like to say uh, how uh, rapidly this industry has grown, and in part, it's benefited from significant drops in um, cost and improvements in efficiency. The amount that you can get out of a standard uh, module today has grown from 300 just a few years ago, 300 watts to 400 to 600 watts, or something like that. So you now can put, uh, you know, more in, you can get more energy for every acre. You get more energy out of the modules for every square foot on your rooftop. Uh, you know, it's a very uh, good uh, story about uh, how learning curves have driven an industry. Now, we are facing, the industry is facing significant um, increases in costs now with supply chain issues, and there are regulatory issues as well, but maybe I'll let others weigh in on the state of the uh, industry at the moment. Garrett, you want to jump in there? Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to thank you, Michael, and thank the RNG policy team for having me here today. Uh, yeah, I build on that absolutely. I mean, we've seen great progress over the course of the last decade, building on a lot of great research in the decades prior to finally see have solar, you know, you know, pun intended, I guess, see its moment in the sun. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of great growth here in the United States and worldwide. But you know, there there are still you know challenges that are going to need to be faced. Um, we certainly need to make sure that we are ensuring that supply chains are able to deliver the totality of the products that are needed. Um, as is known in the solar industry today, there are some challenges related to, to trade issues, uh, poor flavor in the supply chain and things like that, which we are certainly looking to address and have to expand on them if there are questions. And then also we need to make sure that we have the, the domestic capacity to be able to deploy all of the solar that we need. So this includes making sure that we have the robust, diverse, and, uh, and frankly large workforce to be able to get all the solar that we need into the field. We need to make sure that financial parties, when we are paying for these systems and taking on the risk of deploying a system, understand those risks, and we're making sure that we're technologically buying down those to make sure that we are building more reliable and, uh, and, and longer lasting systems so that people can be able to harvest that economic benefit over longer periods of time. So I think there's, there's certainly a, a lot of progress that's been made, a lot more progress needs to be made if we want to hit the Biden administration decarbonization goals, particularly for the electricity sector by 2035. We need to be installing solar about two to five times as fast as we are today. And so there's a number of factors that, that go into this, but I think the, the future is, is very bright, even though I'd, on any road, there are always some, some bumps in the near term that we just got to work through. Great, great. And Jeff, what's the view from the distributor's sun deck? So um, I would say the future of solar and the state of solar is electrifying. Um, we, um, when I think about the industry and where things are going, I personally think uh, about gigaton scale. So uh, because I think about the, the, um, in the environment, I think about the economy, and I think about greenhouse gas reduction and changing where we are. So while we're talking about solar today, solar is a really critical component to achieving gigaton uh, scale. When I think about the state of it, I think about a couple of buckets. So I think about policy, I think about technology, I think about the capital markets, I think about the corporations um, who create a lot of greenhouse gas and use tremendous amount of power, and I think of communities. And all of those, policy, technology, capital markets, corporations, communities play together, and they each have a ha, have a role. They, they each have their own sandbox. And what's really important to achieving gigaton scale is to is is, is eliminating barriers and making it easier for everyone to play, so that we can uh, construct and uh, and build. I'll, I'll conclude this part just by saying that my view and Distribute Sun's view is that market approaches drive U.S. decarbonization and competitiveness. Right. So everything that we do and everything that we advocate for is in the realm of enhanced market approaches because it'll get us to decarbonization faster and it'll help make both the United States more competitive and this industry and the solar industry uh, more competitive. I think that's a great way to transition into the next question and I want to pick it up with you, Jeff, to lead us off on it. Uh, and it folds from, you know, getting to that gigaton scale. You know, you talk about market approaches, what do you see, you know, are some uh, examples in perhaps from the 15 states where, where you all are 
um, perhaps where you want to be in terms of you know changing the market levers, uh, the policy drivers vis-a-vis -vis origination, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, customer acquisition, design, permitting. Where, where do we need to see changes uh, to, to deliver on that gigaton scale that you're talking about? So thanks for asking. And, you know, while, we, while we've nominally been in 15 states, I'd like to be in all 50 states, right? And we, we've got Fortune 100 companies who are in all 50 states, and it's a bit of an impediment when I have to answer the question that, no, ma'am, we can't be in all 50 states today because of impediments. So it's not that just this is what we've grown to, it's that these are the places that, that, that are able, where one is able to go. So a couple of overview things. So markets are efficient, right? The fact that we've built in 15 states is that we're allowed to and enabled to build there. The others are not. So, so uh, tax policy is very inefficient. Um, um, it's, it's, um, tariffs have been, uh, by increasing costs, uh, very inefficient. At the, um, at the um, state level, they're all kind, of, and, and most of the most of the ground game to build infrastructure plants is at the state and local level. It's about net metering. Um, it's about rules for dynamic pricing. It's about creating um, distributed energy resource rules to do two-way sales of electricity and power. Um, it's about um, the the meters that customers have, whether they're homeowners and apartment dwellers or corporations, uh, allowing two-way and smart meters. Uh, to allow the system to be integrated in a better way. It's about enabling smart trading markets. Um, you know, the, the, the uh, renewable energy credits, uh, which are a creature of state policy, um, work really well when they work well, and when they're either non-existent or flawed, they slow market adoption. Um, and the final thing that I'll mention on, uh, on this is, is the, the grid itself, right? So there's a lot of conversation and the, and the 1.1 trillion dollar plan that went through uh, funds um, some of the uh, upgrade to the um, to the transmission grid, and that's a very complicated subject. So even if even though there's money in legislation, the process and time to implement that will either make us or break us, and we need to we need to get on with that because it's it's critical that it happen. And so that's a good way to segue to Garrett. Um, where is the solar energy technology office in trying to perhaps, let's say, play air traffic control in some of those spaces, if at all? Garrett, please. Sure. Uh, yeah, sure. So the role of solar tech energy technologies office, we are most well known for our R&D work that we do across all the technologies, both in photovoltaics, contributing solar, thermal power, grid, et cetera. You know, we definitely have a robust efforts in what we call kind of the soft cost space, which I think encumbers, encompasses a lot of this. You know, in this space, I think Jeff hit on a lot of great points. I think one of the challenges and, and opportunities we always have as a country is that we have a bit of a patchwork so we can see what works somewhere versus what doesn't work elsewhere. But I think a big role for the federal government is to be able to say, okay, this pathway is working in XYZ state, and that pathway might not be working as well in ABC state. And so how can we really illustrate what is working such that people can try to bring a little bit more harmony in terms of how they do work? So, I mean, one example that I think is, is great is, is kind of the permitting space. If you think about like 19,000 authorities having jurisdiction in the United States, each person wants to do things slightly differently, whether it's first name first or last name first on an application, this makes it really difficult for businesses to do business. So what I think we need to do is be able to recognize that there should be local autonomy and we should recognize that, but how do we put into place kind of the tools or practices that will allow kind of more universal usage or more universal um, information to be deployed to all those areas. So one program that we've done recently is called the Solar App, Solar APP, which is basically an automated permitting processing tool that uh, different jurisdictions can opt into, and then they can use to kind of streamline their permitting. We have some initial data from our initial pilot cities, which are mostly in California and Arizona, but they're spreading across the US, where we're seeing permitting time for rooftop systems to drop for less, to a, less than a day. From places that adopt this. And so I think that's just one example about how we can still allow for each group to kind of have their own unique way of looking at things, but we need to do a better job of leveraging IT, leveraging best practices, bringing together parties who can figure out how to come together with better ways to say do interconnection, things like that. And so our office's role is really 
bring together the data, develop the tools, the models, and ultimately connect people so that hopefully we can drive more efficiency across all of these spaces. And the last thing I'll say is I know Jeff touched on tariffs really briefly. Uh, for the record, the solar office, we do not are not really the people who put tariffs into place, but uh, we certainly try to represent uh, as the government's experts what the impacts of those are, both in terms of deployment and potentially the manufacturing space and so forth. And so there's always kind of robust conversations as everyone knows going on to try and figure out how to make a balance between really accelerating deployment while still trying to be able to capture domestic gains in areas like manufacturing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so Professor, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no jobs and no investment and have been a detriment to our economy. But I can say that because I'm not in the government. And, and before we come to you, Professor Brown, I'll just remind everybody, please jump in if there's specific things that, that come up in the back and forth. We want this to be as interactive as, as we possibly can through these Hollywood squares. So, Professor Brown, uh, what, what's it looking like, uh, you know, from the from the deck of the Energy Policy Lab? Um, and and not, not just on the research side, I'm especially curious, you know, where are your next generation students? Where are they going to be innovating to solve some of these problems? That, that Jeff is trying to tackle and that and then that Garrett is trying to sort of, you know, regulate as it were. Uh, yeah. What does it look like from, from that vantage in, in Georgia Tech? Uh, well, the uh, students that are coming out of the, uh, rec the curriculum at Georgia Tech have so many offers to make uh, such a difference in all kinds of um, jobs across the country, the government and business and non-for-profits. Um, one of my recent fairly recent uh, PhDs with Xiao Jing Sun, who now runs the solar um, program at Wood McKinsey. So I did check in with her on the state of solar and uh, got a couple of pointers. I wanted to mention, uh, I, Garrett, thank you for talking a bit about interconnection issues, the cues, you know, that are uh, causing so much capacity to be held up. I got an estimate from Xiao Jing that uh, the queue at ERCOT is 30 gigawatts. And uh, the, that's got to be an incredibly, um, hopefully that's a, a cue that FERC is going to help to tackle um, their cues in other parts of the country, their cues uh, in, in Massachusetts, where uh, commercial um, solar projects are held up because they're trying to figure out how to allocate the cost of uh, making improvements to the distribution system to enable a large amount of solar to be installed. So these are, um, again, issues that perhaps FERC can weigh in on. Um, the the uh, FERC um, jurisdictional um, authority is typically uh, linked to things such as uh, congestion, but I believe that they're going to begin interpreting that also to um, more broadly talk about uh, reliability. And what does it mean to have insufficient, this backlog and insufficient capacity of solar reaching the marketplace uh, from a, a reliability perspective? So you know, hopefully we'll have a couple of federal agencies uh, helping to break through this log jam of um, projects that are in the queue. But thank you for asking about students because that's always an exciting topic and I'll weigh in some more if, if I can on as the dialogue continues. Excellent, excellent, wonderful. So in this sort of what's stalled and what's not, I, I wanna pivot to something that a couple of folks have flagged in terms of tariffs and trade. Uh, you know, nearly two thirds of modules, uh, you know, are coming uh, and produced in China. Uh, we've seen, you know, the, the sidebar conversations uh, that aren't certainly sidebar, but uh, around human rights, around the Olympics and so forth. Um, what do you see uh, or do you see, uh, you know, this, uh, I'll say, bias to, to China and production? Uh, is it a problem for the industry? Uh, how do we address it? How do we navigate it? Um, should folks be concerned? Uh, how do we deal with the sort of the need for domestic supply? And, and maybe Marilyn, we can start with you since you've been on the line with Wood Mac. So. <laughs> All right. Well, we do need more supply to meet the goals that we have for, from the administration. Um, and uh, the, uh, it's very difficult to be competitive in the world market when you have to pay three or four times, you know, you've got to pay layers and layers of tariffs. So when uh, Germany goes to purchase 
uh, solar panels from China, they pay, well, you know, half the price or something that we do. So it's, uh, it's very difficult to compete under those circumstances. But, um, you know, given that we're going to have those tariffs for a while, so within that, that framework, um, I uh, am uh, very interested in the ability to um, you know, to continue to scale up our our get our soft costs down and and scale up. We've got in Georgia a new company from uh, South Korea, Hanwha, which is uh, now the largest module modular modular module assembler <laughs> assembly plant in the country, and we're very proud. Georgia's done a, you know, a lot to bring in. Uh, companies like that that are key to the clean uh, energy future, you know, in terms of battery recycling, battery manufacturing, EV production. You know, we're seeing a big boom. It's real. We're we're able to demonstrate that all of this is good for the economy of Georgia and elsewhere. So um, we can, um, you know, we just have to have to gear up. We're not able to meet the needs of the demand for um, modules in this country. As it currently stands. Absolutely. Maybe, maybe I can pop in there. So I just want to touch on one thing uh, or a couple of things related to this. It's a really important question. So obviously, if you're any business, you'd find be hard pressed to find a business that's excited to have one supplier for one component or have one. Thing. You want to have multiple robust supply yeah. chains. And today, there are portions of the the module supply chain that are almost wholly owned in China. For instance. The wafering portion of the manufacturing process, the ingoting portion, is about 97% contained in the United States. And uh, sorry, China rather. Um, so while we do have modules being built out at places like Hanwha and Georgia, and that's great, that doesn't eliminate the bottleneck that's further upstream. And so I know at the Department of Energy, we're very interested in thinking about how we can diversify our supply chains. I mean, one, we obviously want to be cognizant and, and don't condone the use of forced labor or anything like that in any supply chain for people that are going to be supplying modules to the United States. So, of course, we need to be dealing with that challenge. And we are very actively engaged with a number of different organizations in the DOE to address that. I realize we might not be moving as fast as some people would like, but it is stuff that is actively moving on a day-to-day -day basis. In terms of kind of the broader different components of a module, you know, we are obviously looking at whether there's alternative technologies like perov sites and things that might be way out in the future. But in terms of the near term, I think there is definitely room for us to potentially be driving more manufacturing of earlier, uh, further upstream portions of the module. And that is something that I think Senator Ossoff had put out in, in a bill that people are talking about, including in Build Back Better. And also beyond that, we also want to make sure that if, if manufacturing capacity doesn't get built here, that what are our options to be able to diversify it just beyond the countries where it essentially resides today. So how can we think about think about calling it friend shoring? We're just thinking about the um, finding other people who have kind of similar values and similar ways and desires of what they want to see out of products and to us. And I think this has become a you know a continually critical um, area because all the countries in, in the world have some very ambitious goals as it relates to deploying solar energy. And that just means going to be really continuing to grow and grow the manufacturing capacity to be able to deliver all of those goals. And so for all countries, I think we're gonna to wanna to see a broader diversification of who is making these components, who is selling these components and how we're getting them into countries so we can be as robust as possible to, to mitigate kind of the ebbs and flows or peaks and valleys of an industry and trying to have something that's more consistent and sustainable over the long term to, to meet the very ambitious administration goals. So, so with my gigaton hat on, right, uh, we need to get there faster. We need to get to the goal line faster. The planet's not waiting for us. From the economy point of view, we need to focus, in my opinion, on jobs and investment. And if we do jobs and investment right, we'll get to gigatons um, and we'll, we'll achieve um, energy justice in communities. But we need to get there. And to get there, we need to be uh, deconflicted and deconfused. So the, the jobs uh, in a solar manufacturing plant uh, in, in China are very, very few. The jobs in solar installation are very many. So if we want to do a gigaton and build a, t build a large quantity of solar in the United States, the jobs and the capital in that capital stack are American, and they're right here and they're local. Um, if, if I wanted to buy, if any of the four of us want to buy a solar panel this afternoon, 
uh, in Southeast Asia and have it delivered in Southeast Asia, you're going to pay under 20 cents a watt for it. If you want to buy the exact same solar panel, the same product this afternoon and have it delivered somewhere in the middle of the United States, it's about 40 cents a watt. Why does it cost twice as much in the United States? It's because of tariffs. It's because of supply chain disruption. It's because of transportation. And it's because of regulation in the United States. Those are things that we can fix. And there's no reason we should be paying twice as much for panels because that extra 20 cents is just grist in the, in the wheel that's, gonna, that's slowing progress. Because everything else, as Marilyn was saying, is coming down in price, right? Because it, this is a scale economy. And the more we do, the lower the unit cost. We have to get out of our own ways. And the, and the, the, the solar value chain has moved itself uh, to China. Uh, they are a low. They are the low-cost producer of the um, of the capital-intensive but low-employment industry called making solar panels, and we, we need to use their panels and others and let the world supply chain solve that problem. Jeff, I think that's a wonderful uh, way to pivot. But I, I see Marilyn, you want to come into that directly. Well, I wanted to jump on the, um, we've been looking at the supply and, of uh, modules and, and commodities, but I also think that we need to work on the efficiency with which we get these to uh, the consumer. So if we're talking about mm -hmm. distributed um, solar, and I've been looking recently with my students at the literature and experience of other countries and places around a few uh, experimental uh, programs in the U.S. that have bundled electric vehicles with solar packages and have discovered in some very good, uh, strong consumer research that people are willing to pay more readily for a bundle of those two packages than they are for either one of them individually. Right. That there's value they each add to the other. And I think you could probably imagine bundling some efficiency in there as well. And of course, adding the right rates. So uh, we really need more science to go into uh, the to, you know the total package and bundle that we offer to our to our um, our markets. I think I was curious if anyone had uh, studied that. So you're a professor, and what I would say based on what you just said is you're giving us an arithmetic lesson, and the arithmetic <laughs> you just taught us is that two plus two equals five. If yeah. You Together, you get more than the sum of the parts. That's right. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> I have to say, just maybe a quick comment on that is like business model innovation. Innovation is, of course, going to be needed, and I think that's a place where the private sector can really excel in thinking about how do we package different value streams together to make them beneficial to a variety of different consumers. I think really studying and understanding the full breadth of people that want to adopt solar. Moving away from kind of the stereotype of just you know high high income individuals moving over there, but how do we look at the full breadth of people who can be potential consumers and be able to dial in products and combinations of products? And like that? I think that's really exciting to see what a lot of the private sector does in that space. And and that's the way I want to pivot back to a, 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 a just a category that you called out, Jeff. You 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 flag the issue of an energy justice, and you put that in the context of you know, jobs here onshore at home in the U.S. Uh, I want to sort of probe a little bit uh, just because of some of the things that we're involved in. You know, I'm, you know, a co-founding board member of something called Black Owners of Solar Services um, and trying to stand up that that effort. And so my question is, is, you know, distributed solar, you know, has certainly a huge uh, upside for marginalized communities, as you well know, uh, both on, you know, in terms of the consumption of energy, as well as those that are going to be putting it on roofs or putting it on the ground. Um, but there are certain barriers, tons of barriers to, uh, you know, that broader access to folks on the margins. And so I'm wondering, maybe we start with you because you, you called out energy justice. Uh, what are your thoughts on how we might address some of these issues? I mean, you know, on the, on the consumption side, you know, you know, there's barriers in terms of residential, in terms of your, just your FICO score. Uh, if you if you're lucky enough and privileged enough to even own a home in the first place, um, so maybe can you talk about that o on multiple sides? You know, both you know on the the employment side, on the you know, consumption side, and so forth. Um, please. Well, thanks for asking because I'm all over energy justice, and it's a systems problem. It's not an individual problem uh, and opportunity. Um, so 
first of all, looking at the system of how energy is generated, where is the source of generation? And you just said, is it on the roof of your house? Is it on a utility scale field out there? Is it a nuclear plant where it comes from many places? Um, the system becomes a stronger, better functioning system um, if it's a diverse system that has a lot of sources. So, so um, a, a mesh grid is a stronger grid than a hub and spoke system. Uh, so what, one of the things we're doing writ large with, with distributed energy resources, with DERs, with community solar, with, we're, we're, we're moving, we haven't moved yet, but we're moving slowly to a mesh system instead of hub and spoke, which was the 20th century utility model. And the mesh grid is a much stronger and more resilient grid than the hub and spoke grid, number one. Number two, the more you get to a mesh grid instead of a hub and spoke grid, the more you change the air quality in communities. So one of the energy justice issues is air quality in communities, which used to be called pollution. Um, and we want less pollution, we want better air quality. We, and where do we want it? We want it where people live, we want it closer to them. So we have to get rid of that, which is affecting the bad air quality and bringing the good and the, and the mesh system and the closer to home uh, generation is better. Next, you mentioned rooftop solar, which I think is a bit of a canard. So, you know, rooftop solar only goes on roofs. That's obvious. Uh, it has to go on roofs of people who have homes to put it on. Some people live in apartments. You know what? There are rich people that live in apartments and poor people that live in apartments. It's that, but the point is, if it's an apartment, it doesn't go on your roof. So the, 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 the mesh network system that affects everybody, which is the solar for all, is community solar. Right, so there's this fabulous business model, which is nascent. It really just started in the middle of the last decade, but it's growing very fast and states are adopting it because they realize that folks, and we happen to be one of the largest community solar developers in the country, but um, community solar can go in a near the urban core. So it still affects the air quality, uh, but it's not on your roof, right? So in terms of community solar, we don't care if you have a, if you have a roof. Right, we don't care if you're rich or poor. We don't care where you live. You have to be in the defined area, and, we'll, and we're going to sell you solar, and you can drive by and see it if you want. But it's not physically on your roof, so it affects it affects people and community. You know, back to the investment and the you know and, and that side. The more we build, the more jobs there are. Okay, building solar plants creates a lot of jobs. Um, it's a it's a form of a construction trade, and these jobs are open to everybody. Um, and you know they're hard, but they're not that hard. And you know people need to get trained. People need to get trained in the work workforce to do these kind of jobs. And 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 the more the job, the more the market expands, the more Mar Maryland will be encouraged to train the people and and give give them degrees and get out there. So I think we're right. I think we're making good progress, but but we have to get on with building the core figure, uh, because and the more we do, uh, the more the units will help. Um, um, communities, it'll improve air quality, it'll improve individual lives. Great. Yeah, I might hop in and, and maybe build off a couple of those comments because I think you had a number of things right on the head. So you know one thinking about kind of that grid resilience or kind of mesh network grid, that's very important too. Unfortunately we have a number of underserved communities that are kind of at the end of feeders and things like that. And we need to really be thinking about how we provide reliable and resilient energy to everyone. You know, in terms of the business models, I think community solar is absolutely one, and I commend Jeff for being one of the businesses that's really trying to trying to capture, go into that market. We run a program called the National Community Solar Partnership, where we're trying to bring together more parties to share best practices, to share more about what can be done, and work with, say, states or utilities or others, and really kind of cohort-based groups to be able to share best practices, understand how it's working with them otherwise. We actually launched a recent portion of that program called Credit Ready Solar, which we're very excited about. You're really looking at how do you finance systems that would have very focused on potentially low-income households. So how do we bring together both impact investors, how do we bring together developers, and in some cases, how do we even mobilize philanthropic capital in cases where there might be some sort of financing gap or financing need to be able to make all parties feel comfortable with moving forward with a given system. So we're really excited to, to see where that grows. And Jeff hit the nail on the head in terms of workforce. The you know, workforce can obviously be more diversified we can be bringing more people who are local to where systems are being deployed to do those installations. And those are very solid and well-paying jobs. The last thing I would say that, that Jeff didn't touch on, and I think it's just maybe broad about the solar industry in general, is just there's an informa information asymmetry, right? So we still need to be able to make sure that we're giving actionable information 
to all potential parties, to all households in ways that they can consume and understand it. The way the four of us are talking about solar energy here is not the way that my father talks about solar energy, and it's definitely not the way that someone in potentially an underserved community is even thinking about solar energy. So we really need to make sure that we're thinking about how we can kind of reduce those information asymmetries, bring information to people from trusted suppliers of that to allow them to kind of empower themselves to make that energy decision on their own. And, it, and the more people can kind of take ownership of that energy future, the more powerful it will be. I think this is something that particularly needs to be focused on in, in marginalized communities where they might not see the utility or the local government or even the federal government as, as a partner in what they want to do. So we need to figure out how do we deliver the appropriate actual information through the appropriate conduits such that people can realize the opportunities in, in the solar workforce, in different business models to leverage it to lower their energy burden and so forth. Now, I'd like to um, fill in the gap with a little bit more focused on uh, rooftop solar and uh, marginalized uh, and disadvantaged communities. As you all have seen, states across the country are reconsidering their net metering uh, programs because they recognize that uh, their large, it's the, the revenues needed to uh, boost the uh, purchase price of uh, the electricity sold back to the utility is coming from everyone, is coming from, in particular, low-income households who generally aren't able to, to uh, participate in this program. So their rates are going up and yet they're not able to uh, uh, typically receive any of this benefit. So, you know, that's the threat that we're currently under uh, from Florida over to California and many states in between. Um, so we really need to figure out how this um, program, this uh, technology can be more inclusive. Um, love to uh, make a call out to the Department of Energy's Weatherization Assistance Program. You know, with the 2020 Energy Policy Act, it was given the authority to qualify rooftop solar as an eligible component of its program. Yeah, I didn't, Garrett, I, if you had something to do with that, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm so glad. <laughs> but um, the, and the good thing about, of course, its inclusion is that that program can make some um, repairs to buildings, right? That's often what's needed. You can't put a, a, a panel on top of a roof that's got a big hole in it or, you know, can't support it. So it's an investment often needs to take place first. But, you know, that uh, funding is probably not sufficient. The amount that the weatherization program can invest in fixing a roof may not be sufficient much of the time to be able to put that uh, panel uh, on. So we've got to figure out how to fill that gap. And uh, you know, the program has partnered with a lot of utilities across the country, but not with all of them. Some utilities don't do uh, partnerships with the weatherization assistance program. They try to have their own independent programs. And I think shame on them because you've got this foundational program that's been operating successfully for decades. And, and together, I think that much could be done. So those partnerships, I think, are, are part of what we, we need to forge and to deliver the rooftop option to uh, homes that need a little bit of improvement uh, in order to take them. Well, I'm glad you flagged, uh, Professor Brown, the sort of, I'll call it some of the dissonance in, in some approaches with utilities and, and with respect to distributed energy resources. And I, I wanna get to that question, but before I do, uh, I wanna just encourage folks in the audience to please you know, put your questions in the chat because we're gonna probably have maybe one more round of questions before we come to some of those questions. I'm sure folks out there are, are eager to, to bring some questions to all of you. So I encourage people to do that. So with respect then to distributed energy resources, you know, right now, you know, as you all know, and, and you, you mentioned, Professor Brown, you know, the, the challenges in California and Florida and so forth, and we all know too well, you know, those of us certainly on the business side, um, you know, those, those challenges coming forward. Uh, you know, where do you see uh, this dissonance between utilities and, uh, you know, DER, uh, you know, managers, as it were, playing out? Uh, is it going to get worse before it gets better? Uh, are we going to, you know, you know, in in my home state of Michigan, you know, there's a a, a cap that utilities have on the on the on the law on the books uh, of one percent. A couple of utilities, actually one, has gone and repeatedly asked to to go above that that cap. And they've actually gone up to I think three percent um, of their overall, you know, install. So 
Where do you see that uh, playing out? Uh, do you see some new states uh, getting into this uh, that are going to be walking back uh, DER? Um, what's, what's your read of it so far? Um, I'll jump in since I was the last to, to talk. <laughs> um, so the uh, problem is all about return on investment when it's an investor-owned utility, you know, which we have a lot of in in um, the southeast and these vertically integrated markets. And so they need to have the you know their business case for getting engaged and supporting this effort. It's got to be clear and um, and profitable, <clears throat> or um, at least neutral <laughs> if others are going to take the business and run with it. So yeah. you know, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to this problem of uh, incentives and how to, and I don't have an answer. So maybe, maybe others. Well, then I'll, I'll add a nuance to it for, for Garrett and Jeff. Does the business case trump uh, the uh, overhang of the climate catastrophe? Uh, at last I checked, we're in both. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we wouldn't want to have only a business uh, outlook uh, and 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 forget about this other existential crisis right on uh, right alongside of us. So how does that play out? Is, is there a variance there? And, and Professor Brown, if you want to come back in on that, please do. I think you've got the 20th century playing against the 21st century, quite frankly. So I think I think the utilities um, are um, playing a stack deck of cards because of the way the regulatory system works in most states. Most state public service commissions. Um, do what the utilities ask them to do. Uh, that's a bad game. That's not, it's not going to help the environment. It's not going to help environmental justice. It's not going to build uh, renewable energy. It's going to slow everything. I think that they, writ large, hire a well-known advisory services firm. This is a pun called Stall, Hinder, and Delay. The reason they hire Stall, Hinder, and Delay is to stall, <laughs> hinder, and delay progress. The reason they want to stall, hinder, and delay progress is because it's in their financial interest to keep getting the cash flow that they got yesterday, and they're not looking at the 21st century. You know, going back to the transmission grid, which the infrastructure legislation, the $1.1 trillion, has a lot of money for, uh, I'm deeply worried that that's not going to be spent. Why is it not going to be sent, spent? Because the transmission grid in the United States is run by the utilities. And the tr transmission grid is a 20th century grid, uh, which operates at 40% capacity utilization. And all the new investment is going to make it run at 80% capacity utilization. And they're just afraid that they don't have the local infrastructure and the, and the uh, process to deal with that. So infrastructure inve transmission grid investment is going to take 10 years instead of three years. And it's going to be too little too late because of stall, hinder, and delay. I don't think that there's much data uh, that says that, in fact, uh, the DERs and the rooftop solar are having one iota of impact on cost for anybody in the United States of America. I think that's all made up. I think the solar that exists as a percentage of anything is really small. It's really small. And I think that uh, people are using that, uh, that conversation, not Professor Brown, but the utilities, uh, to, to, to try and stall change. And, and you know, it, it, it sounds like a Great argument if you say poor people are being disadvantaged, we better stop this. People love hearing that, but I don't think it's based on the truth. It, so is, Gary, a real wanna... it is a real conundrum though, because uh, you know, in rate making, you're supposed to uh, have rates follow costs, the, you know, the, the source of costs. And we know that fixed costs are increasing, especially as, um, as sales drop with more distributed uh, solar and I, I i agree with you jeff right now it's not a big deal but i'm hoping it'll become a big deal in which case we've got to figure out how to set these rates and how to allow utilities to cover their fixed costs which are going to be you know they they need to be there because we need <laughs> we need their backstop right we, we can't just all um um the, what's it called the leaves the the utility you know the, the grid so different states are taking different approaches. One state that's kind of reinventing the wheel, reinventing the, the business model for DERs and, 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 and for doing this is New York with the value of distributed energy resources, which they yeah. call leader. And you know, I think they've taken a lot of leadership and have, have actually uh, looked at uh, uh, kind of all sides and figured out how to uh, make it work economically and in a systems approach.
Mm-hmm. Apologies uh, for jumping in I here. I want to give Garrett a chance. Please go uh, ahead, uh, Garrett. Just maybe really fast. And so uh, I'm, I'm not going to weigh in one way or the other as to the merits of this because obviously as the federal government, we want to see the policies develop at the local level. I think just going back to one of our very early points, this is one of, well, it's a headache sometimes. It's also one of the beauties of the U.S. where we can try to work some of this stuff out in individual regions, in individual states, and so forth. And so I think what's great about this is it's driving conversation. It's going to be driving kind of that more hard data approach to how our costs really being allocated, how costs, how should costs be fairly allocated and so forth. These are not going to be easy conversations given the number of parties that are impacted by them, the number of interests that are kind of entrenched, the number of new interests that want to be playing in the game and so forth. So it's it's going to be a, a challenging space. And you know, I'll just touch really fast, I know Jeff mentioned infrastructure, that is, or, or transmission in particular. And so DOE is working and thinking hard about how we will deploy those funds. And we think that there is a lot of a lot of possibilities to be able to try to figure out how we can alleviate congestion when we see it. How can we, instead of maybe laying more transmission, think about how we upgrade the capabilities that we have in existing transmission so that we can be handling more capacity and things of that nature. So a lot of conversations are, are happening on that front. But just, just to circle back, this is definitely a, a topic that is, is, is big, this kind of DER versus utilities end of the spectrum. It's not something that's gonna be solved this year or next year, or maybe by 2030. But like, it's really driving an important conversation. And I think what's great is that now we can move from a point of having kind of emotional conversations to trying to figure out how do we dig to the actual data? What does the data tell us about how this works? What are some optimal ways that we might be able to be spreading costs in an equitable uh, and fair manner? So it'll be really interesting to see how this conversation evolves in the months and years to come. Well, the last thing I want to be associated with is stall, hindering, or delaying questions uh, that we have from some of our, our audience. Uh, I definitely don't want to be associated with that SHD firm. So please, I, I think we've got some questions in the stack, uh, and I would love to hear uh, the folks on the OEP side uh, share some of those with me. Um, Perfect. Thank you so much to all our panelists. We do have numerous questions lined up, so we'll get through as many as we have time for. Uh, first question here, and we've talked a little bit about this already, but this is from Khalifa Lee uh, regarding sort of outreach to low income and disadvantaged communities. Curious for panelists thoughts on how do we actually create programs, grants and boards? You know, what's the best approach to create these programs that can help these communities? The sort of top down. Yeah, I can try to hop in there. I mean, I think as I was alluding to earlier, I think a big part is finding the appropriate person to be delivering a message. Like, well, who is the trusted messenger in a local community and how can we equip them with as much factual information about what solar can mean to a given community? And, so, and how do we make sure that we are we are being honest about it, right? So if, like, if the biggest challenge to your community in terms of say a weather event is snow, then maybe we want to be talking candidly about using other generation resources, right? So I think one of the parties we need to make sure that we're not just kind of coming in from a self-serving standpoint, that we're bringing all the information to the table. So finding some of those local parties is big. And I think another very important part of that is making sure you're providing those local information providers with the resources to do it. So we've tried to stand up a number of programs over the years where we fund different parties to kind of work with local level entities so that they can provide technical assistance to rural communities and so forth. But sometimes people actually need resources to be able to even receive technical assistance. How can you make sure that you're, you're building or making the space available for two people to be able to interact and exchange that information such that it can get to the right point. I think that's the big thing in my mind. It's an information and information trust question, because ultimately once there is the demand, the markets will come in and help solve that and help deploy the system. Yeah, the literature underscores what you've just said, Garrett, that you need to engage the public interest groups, the uh, local um, community action agencies and you know public interest organizations they've shown over and over that if you do that then these programs do t- attract a more diverse uh, clientele so that's definitely got to be part of what we do but i also wanted to make it you know toss out for uh policy designs like play as, pay as you save and on bill financing i think there's a lot to be said there that message again, and then you get the trusted uh, messenger kind of I- idea has to be built into that. But I think that does at least help to get around that initial first cost barrier that is uh, so difficult for many. Because community is a word that means local. Community choice aggregators are a good policy structure uh, mm-hmm. because they're built, they're built yes. around communities. 
And there's a bunch of that in New York and in California and elsewhere. And if the community can have the ability, somewhat by law, to, to select its generation source for the community, and then if it's op offered on an opt-out basis, uh, you can get energy justice, you can clean the environment, you can have better air quality, and as well as, uh, as well as by doing that, uh, bring investment and jobs to the local area. So it's very much win-win as a system. Mm -hmm. And it's deployed locally. Maybe we can have two questions on deck uh, to go around because we're gonna we're gonna run up towards the end, and I've got I want to close out with my last question. So, of so course, please. Uh, one question here. We've had actually numerous questions on this topic, so I'll paraphrase a little bit using this question from Jonah Coca. Uh, the lifespan of solar panels is about 25 to 30 years, and there's a growing debate around re recycling these uh, waste. Um, you know, what are panelists' thoughts on how we actually handle this issue? Are there programs in place looking forward to the, you know, coming deluge of U solar panels? And, and I had a twist. How might we handle it and be Basel Convention compliant, uh, which everybody on here ought to know about? Uh, but go ahead. <laughs> Maybe I can start with a stab at that. So one, this is a topic that our office takes very seriously. We actually were allocated $20 million in the infrastructure infrastructure bill to be look, doing more research and development in the space, trying to really bring together the community. So one of the things that we need to figure out is how to first we bridge the gap between the cost of recycling and the cost of landfill. If you take out transportation, you know, recycling can cost on the order of 10 to $15 a module. You can landfill a module for about $1 to $3. I've heard of some companies out there with promising new processes that might be able to get it down to four to five dollar range, potentially lower, but that's going to need time to incubate and develop. So we're absolutely looking at how can we do this from a technology end. I think another thing we're trying to look at is how do we make sure that we're designing modules such that they are easier to disassemble, easier to reuse the materials and so forth. And finally, is there abilities to be able to refurbish and are there second lives to some of these things? Are there different places or value propositions we can derive from that? I mean, ultimately, there's you know certainly uh, regulatory questions at play with these kinds of things. I know there are petitions related where people talk to the EPA about how to handle solar in different ways, and also solar is handled in different ways in different states, such as California and Hawaii, have slightly stricter means by which to handle modules than the rest of the country. So there's a lot to be done here, um, and obviously, with with millions of modules deployed, and we're expecting millions more, there's something that will be need to be done. But we are definitely have our sights on this this challenge. And really want to figure out the best way that we can have it as circular and you know uh, materials efficient i guess would be the word uh, economy as, as possible mm -hmm. i think that's a good answer and in the interest of uh, the number of questions we have lined up we'll move on to the next one if that's all right um obviously you all spoke a lot about you know the d how do we uh, compensate owners for distributed generation and we obviously have a lot of questions on that topic here um, you know, one question that's come through a few times is, you know, from John Funk, please address the utility argument that owners of rooftop solar are not paying their fair share of costs associated with maintaining the distribution system and can decoupling delivery expenses from rate per kilowatt hour solve this alleged unfairness? Again, there's the simple answer is that's rate design. It's local. There are demand charges. Uh, they, 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 get, they get placed over time. Um, and at the moment, it's not an issue because the units are really small. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let's see here, we have had a few questions as well about Build Back Better. Uh, question here from, bear me one moment, from Tim Kaminsky. Were the investment tax credits from the Build Back Better bill to be broken out and considered separately? Do panelists believe they would receive bipartisan support? <laughs> Hope so. <laughs> oh, no. A tough one, certainly. The Ouija board of Washington. Lovely. Question from Martin Volker. Increasingly, utility distribution and transmission costs more than generating, uh, apologies, increasingly, utility distribution and transmission costs more than generating that kilowatt hour locally. Do panelists think distributed local generation will outpace the grid in this decade? I mean, I think. I'm not going to say it's going to necessarily outpace, but I mean, I think it's certainly something to keep an eye on, right? Solar is an extremely unique value proposition in the world of energy that we've ever known. And so I think that's just something to keep an eye on. And I think there will be more people thinking about how does local deployment and increasingly local consumption play into something like that. 
And you know, that also plays into things. How do you deal with controllable loads? How do you do planning, generation versus loads? And so there's, uh, I'm, I'm interested to see how that space holds up. I am hesitant to do any crystal ball works. Definitely a trend. I'm not sure that uh, DG will ever come uh, grid and centralized plants by the end of 2030, right. but maybe one day. But part of the confusion and opportunity is solar is really cool. It can be little, it can be medium, and it can be large. You can put it on a little shed, you can put it on a factory, and you can put it on hundreds of acres, and it still generates electricity. Those are all different business models and different opportunities for change. Thank you for that. We've also had a few questions on sort of the backlog of solar projects. And Marilyn, you spoke a little bit about this at the outset. Uh, from David Blockstein, what is going on with PGM wanting a moratorium on solar to connect to the grid? Is solar capacity overwhelming the grid? And from Denise Jacobsberg, can you speak about utilities being overwhelmed by the number of solar projects and the two-year wait before a project can be reviewed and approved? Why the wait? Maybe I'll, I'll add a little bit to that. So I think, you know, as we were alluding to a few times, we're really at like a, a shift in how energy is working. You know, many interconnections or utilities set up their programs to work in a linear fashion. So system comes in, they review it, system goes out and so forth. And now we're reaching a world where solar can be deployed at all different levels of the grid, not just the transmission level, which adds to some of the challenge. There's also different kind of rules for how people can hold their lines in different portions of different grids. So can I just hold a spot in line forever? Or can I hold that spot in line and sell it to somebody else? Can I, do I have to actually be serious about developing something to get into line? How do we handle all different uh, uh, fuel sources uh, in an equal way? So I, I think it's, I wouldn't say that this is something about our solar is inherently destabilizing the grid at this point. That's not, that is not the case. I think this is just, the powers that be who are in charge of making sure that the grid is reliable, resilient, and secure are taking their time to make sure that they can live up to their end of that bargain. And so I think with more tools, with more research, more sharing of best practices, we will see some of these bottlenecks, particularly related to interconnection break free. Because you know, when you have gigawatts of of mod or of systems sitting on the side, that's billions of dollars waiting to be saved, that's billions of dollars of people waiting to be employed and so forth. And that's that's in nobody's best interest. I think we're coming up on the end. And, and before I want to just take the, the the dealer's choice here, privilege of the chair, and maybe in just ten seconds or fifteen max, tell us what we're going to see in the next five to ten years. And Marilyn, since you were going to start, can you start with that? What is well, the true I'm forecast? To, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about how um, you know storage is going to come to the rescue eventually. Uh, it will be it'll become more affordable. But I also uh, am hoping that we're going to see more integrated projects where you have developers coming in with a combination of of uh, wind and solar, maybe some biomass. You can have some dispatched dispatchable opportunities. Germany did that very well. You know, it's, it's uh, communities did that and um, owned the systems and made a lot of money. They ended up reducing income taxes to their to their residents because they were doing such a great job and some of these community district uh, systems. So I would like to see more than more of that uh, in the in these queues for upcoming great. projects. Great. Garrett, 10 seconds. Next sure, five. I think we're going to see a, a lot of deployments getting past the current supply chain bottlenecks. I'm really excited to see storage come onto the scene, particularly alternatives, so longer duration storage that are going to need to fill the gaps of lithium ion can't. What I'm really excited to see is increasingly inverter driven grids as we move away from the inertial based grids that are out there today. That is going to be absolutely critical. And I think over the next five or 10 years, we're going to see those start to be deployed in, in more significant ways. Last but not least, Jeff, 10 seconds. I'll summarize by saying it's going to be big, really big. Um, it's because uh, money economics drive. Uh, the cost of solar is incredibly low and, go, and going lower, despite the, uh, you know, the, some of the things we've been talking about. And, it, and that's just going to continue through the next decade. Look at the Lazard Levelized Cost of Energy Study and just keep following it when you then put storage and, and, and solar and other technologies together, you have a strong, resilient, reliable grid. Thank you, panelists. Wonderful discussion. Bill, take us home. Yeah, I hate to uh, jump in because we could obviously dive deeper and spend a couple more hours on most of these topics, but really want to thank all of you, Michael, Marilyn, Garrett, Jeff, for 
a fascinating, really insightful discussion touching on so many of the key issues. Um, we're clearly going to follow up on a lot of them. Uh, thanks to our audience for your strong questions and for being with us today. Um, thanks to all of our uh, partners and supporters, um, as well as uh, particularly to Sarah Fitz and Schiff Harden for co-hosting this event today on solar. Uh, so I wish all of you a um, very good rest of the week and uh, look out for our next webinar coming up in early March. And uh, thanks once again to our outstanding panel for this discussion. All the best to all of you and have a great rest of your day. Yeah, it's been thanks, fun. everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.